to our next panel discussion on internal controls and challenges and the role of internal auditor. Uh, may I invite Puneet Gupta to join the stage to moderate the session? Thanks, Puneet. Uh, I welcome our first panelist, Anish Motwani. Anisha, sorry, Anisha Motwani. Anisha is a founder and director, Storm and Norm Ventures and a director at Wellspun India about health, l and investment, to name a few. Anisha has been an advisor with the World Bank on the Swachh Bharat program and has, uh, has been voted as a 50 most powerful woman in Indian business by Business Today for three consecutive years. Welcome. <clears throat> Inviting our next panelist, Mr. Chetan Mathur. Uh, Chetan is an independent director at Pratap Snacks and Mahindra HZPC. He has spent more than 23 years in PepsiCo uh, in leadership role and advised companies on governance, controllership, internal controls, finance transformation, and risk management. Thanks, Chetan. Uh, requesting our next panelist, uh, Sunil Bora. Sunil. Uh, Sunil is the Group uh, Chief Finance Officer for Uno Minda. Sunil joined Minda as a Group uh, Chief Financial Officer after spending around two decades at Vedanta Group and uh, is also the winner of Excellence in Governance, Risk and Compliance Award at the first edition of the CII CFO Excellence Award held in 2021. Welcome, Sunil. Uh, may I invite Bhaskara Subramaniam, our next panelist. Uh, Bhaskara is the Chief Internal Auditor at Tata, uh, Tata Capital and has more than 35 years of experience in the areas of governance, risk management, and business excellence. He has also served as a member of CII National Committee on Financial Reporting and uh, in ASCOM National Council for Internal Audit and Risk Management. Welcome, Bhaskara. Over to you, Puneet. Thanks, Ankur. So welcome to the uh, panelists. Uh, we had a great uh, session, uh, panel discussion, a lot of points uh, that got deliberated. Uh, this session, we will uh, focus more on the uh, aspects related to internal uh, controls, internal audit, uh, audit in, uh, in general. Uh, we spoke about the safeguards uh, in the previous uh, session. A uh, lot of safeguards emerge from what the independent directors get to know from uh, the auditors. Uh, and that, in a way, also can be said to be the foundation for uh, strong corporate governance practices and both preventive detective mechanisms to identify if something is uh, uh, go going wrong. Uh, today's discussion, we will uh, try and hear the perspective both from uh, the independent directors in terms of what are their expectations uh, from the uh, auditors and also from the auditors and the KMPs in terms of what are, uh, how do they uh, support the independent directors and what are the, what is the support uh, they need from the uh, independent directors. The panel today uh, consists of uh, independent directors, independent directors who have played substantial role uh, as part of management and internal controls. Uh, we have a chief audit executive and a CFO uh, in the panel to provide us this uh, holistic uh, perspective. So uh, to start the conversation, we saw in the survey that a big number of uh, uh, independent directors believe that the health of internal control is not as good as what is reflected in the uh, annual report. I would like to hear the perspective of my uh, uh, colleague, uh, colleagues here that what are the reasons for the low disclosure levels, why there are no disclosures even in the companies where there are known issues or issues in, uh, uh, emerge on uh, corporate governance uh, matters, and what are the changes that need to be done to enhance the uh, disclosure uh, uh, levels. So I would like to start with you, Anisha, uh, as an independent uh, director. What's your perspective on this uh, topic? and uh, broadly in terms of how the, the reporting can be enhanced in the uh, annual reports. Thank you, Puneet, first of all. 
No, so, uh, you know, uh, I do want to caveat that amongst all these financial wizards, I'm a non-finance person, okay? I'm a consumer person and uh, who also happens to have worked in a financial services industry for a few years and now, you know, a part of uh, several boards. Uh, so, so my experience is truly practical and not academic, okay? And uh, if I look at it purely as, uh, as an independent board member, my observation has been that different, or it's not that, you know, there is one formula that cuts across all organizations. I have seen different appetites across different organizations. There are global organizations, there are Indian entrepreneur-led organizations, there are non-listed entities, there are fund, uh, fund, you know, VC-funded entities. The appetite across all of these varies significantly. And what actually varies is also the definition of what is the strength and nature of controls that you're looking at, okay? And what's the nature of governance that you're looking at? So in many, many global companies, multinational companies, there is a zero tolerance policy. And in many Indian companies, because they are growing at such a fast pace and they've come up as being family businesses, now turning professionals with all the, you know, the, the regulations coming upon them, they are still learning their way around, you know, how to strengthen their governance practices. But what is important to understand is that this is also a cultural issue, okay? As much as it is a process issue, it's a cultural issue. There are technically three levels of defense. Okay? There is the management level of defense, then there is the risk enterprise level of defense, and then there is the internal audit level of defense. If all these three levels of defense are not aligned strongly, okay, and they all work in silos, that is where the real challenge starts happening. You will see that management controls, okay, the that's where the first level of control happens. Each level needs to rely on the next level. The next level needs to rely on the, on the bottom level. Now, what happens is sometimes you feel that you're actually giving up on your independence because you're relying so much on what's coming to you. But if that reliance is not there, then you will start overlapping and playing each other's role. And I've seen that happening in many, many organizations. So it's important that there's a culture of and the reason why that's also happening is because there are no set processes and protocols defined for, you know, how to evaluate an independent, uh, you know, internal processes and audits. Different companies have different frameworks. There's no standard benchmark framework. Like I said, you know, some people, you know, would call out a certain item as low risk, okay? And a global company will call out the same item as an extremely high risk. And as board, what happens is, what comes to you finally, because it's finally a, a time-bound uh, interaction that you have, is the high-risk items, and the rest of it all comes in documents, you know, and, and you're supposed to read through it all. But the discussions that happen on high-risk items, the nature of that high-risk varies from organization to organization. For some organization, a very small matter is very high-risk. For another organization, a very high-risk item is actually a medium-risk or a low to medium-risk. So those standards are actually not in place at this point in time. And the alignment between risk and audit, okay, that the first level of control after the management, you know, uh, you know controls are, are put in place, the risk controls, the ERM framework of the organization needs to be very, very strong. And there... The internal audit is almost an assurance arm of the risk. So if internal, if risk management is developing the risk controls, internal audit is supposed to evaluate them, okay, and review them. As long as that clarity is not there and that alignment is not there, these gaps start emerging. Right. And secondly, I think the definition of, you know, the what is a high risk, what's a medium risk, and what's a low risk needs to be standardized. Currently, there is a lot of disparity around, you know, how organizations view the risk framework. And one of the other things, like, just, just on, as a last note, uh, like I said, you know, I'm a consumer person. Now, there are many people just now focusing on financial risk process risk. There are softer risks that are emerging, reputation risks. In today's world of social media, I mean, the reputation risk is, it could just bring a company down, you know, it just brings governments down, you know. So what are organizations doing about those kind of aspects, you know, leadership risk, you know, talent risk. You know, a lot of effort needs to go in and actually trying and creating a kind of an objective, tangible method of evaluating and understanding these risks as well. 
Great point, Sanisha. I think uh, so some of these points got discussed in the previous uh, panel as well, in the sense uh, that there is a need to bring some level of standardization in terms of what is the high risk, how should uh, boards uh, react. Uh, and when we look at it at an internal control level, I think while the risk appetites will vary, but I think some level of definition uh, might be useful because that's what we heard as well, that a lot of points get categorized as low risk and hence do not get uh, reported, but who def defines what is high risk person? Chetan, so over to uh, you. I think Anisha made a very a, a, a interesting point in terms of how does we bring synergy between risk management and uh, internal audit, in, internal control, and how do we ensure uh, that the risk which truly matter do get covered as part of uh, internal audit? So what are the best practices that you have seen in this space? Uh, Firstly, I must acknowledge that Anisha is my role model as far as a non-finance person talking about finance and <laughs> so to me that's the biggest uh, catalyst to this uh, to, to this issue. We need uh, to make sure that uh, everybody on the table is aware and uh, trained and has the ability to appreciate. Right? I mean, to the extent of saying, uh, let's look at risk appetite, let's let's look at what are the mitigation, etc. Et uh, what's the best practice? It's it's an evolving story. Okay? It is not a fixed story. It's not a start and an end. It is about. Uh, it starts with saying, "Hey, there's a maturity in uh, let's say uh, we call it uh, what do you call it a trail or a, a maturity curve that we all work on, and that maturity curve and is is something that we need to travel on. You can't start being being initiated and become you know optimized the next day. It's impossible." I think the somewhere along the way, uh, again, uh, just remember, we as Indians start a standard that high. Nobody else in the world does that, guys. Nobody else. People will start in step. Okay. And therefore, my question is that, hey, if we have to do something on it, let's, I think, together put a, a plan in place and say year one, year two, year three, year four, etc., etc. And, and, Believe you me, that's kind of worked. I'm sure Sunil would have stories about, I mean, India is a great example. I mean, it's, it's moved the corporate yeah, governance yeah. from, I, I would say, a completely promoter-led company to being professionally managed with, with, with investment coming. So, um, yeah, I think there are, there are excellent stories in India which, 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 uh, which we can all quote. And these are not necessarily the, the Tatas of the world, right? I mean, those guys are yeah, evolved. But these are mid-sized, small-sized, and ancillary companies today are standing up there and being recognized. Absolutely, yeah. Sunil, you would like to add to what? Uh, Sorry, to have pulled you in. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> I think they are all all relevant points, and this is an area which is consistently evolving by the day. Uh, the entire risk concept, which uh, Anisha just spoke about multifaceted uh, risk. But I think what is more important and the most important thing, and I, we also heard this uh, touched, uh, in the previous panel was, what is the tone at the top? I think that, drive, that drives the culture across the organization. What is the DNA of the organization? What is the role my independent director is playing at the board level to maybe set that DNA, to set that tone? Yes, we have uh, some sort of uh, I would say majority of the companies which might be promoted driven, but everybody wants to make it a professionally driven company. And there are genuine reasons about it, right? So let us not go why professional or not professional, because there are n number of merits which I can count of being having a professionally driven company. Because you talk of sustainability, you talk of uh, reliability, you talk of dependence, you talk of wealth creation, you talk of employment creation. There are various other aspects which, which come at the, at the floor. And, uh, we also have, I'm sure a lot of people have heard that uh, the governance standards for all these companies are evolving. And as uh, Mr. Chetan also mentioned, you can't just turn the ship in a year. It's a journey which you have to undertake. Now, for, for example, we took a journey five years back, six years back, raising the bar every year. So you reached here, what next? What next? You can't, as he rightly mentioned, you can't expect to reach here now. So the whole point I am trying to drive home is, what is the tone at the top? Do I as a KMP see my internal auditor as an arm, as a weapon in my armory or I go and defend his points? 
that, that drives the tone. If I don't support my internal auditor, next time he might not he might come with the points. His tone might be coming down. Now, what am I doing in return? I'm actually shooting on my own foot. So I think that's where this tone at the top has to be driven, whether it's an internal auditor, whether it's a statutory auditor, any other uh, such tool is a support to the top management and not a regulatory imposition on the top management. I think that's the big shift in the thought process which needs to be seen because people, you talk to people, people say, no, no, earlier there was an IFC audit, now there is a car audit, now that, why? I think people must understand the importance of this. They are all tools to support the top management to de-risk the board, to de-risk the independent directors. Then independent directors also, I think uh, we have been giving them, uh, trying to give them all the platforms, be it the one-to-one -one audit with the statutory auditors separately, with internal auditors, separate meeting for internal uh, bo uh, board himself as to the governance or the operations of the company, the feedback on the management. There are a lot of tools which you do. We make sure that, uh, in fact, we ask from the independent directors uh, very religiously before uh, at least a month or two as to what do they want to review in the next meeting rather than we impose on them. This is what, please review and give me approval. So I think these are some of the best practices which people have to uh, sort of drive. And if it is not being driven, I would request the independent directors to use this as a tool. If not coming to them, maybe they can, they have all the powers, all the authority to ask from management, from people like me, as to next time, can you please present on this? Can you please come up with this? Please, can, can you do this? Do the risk assessment. Do this, do that. If we don't do, then we should not blame anybody else. I think, I am not defending myself uh, as a KMP, but I can tell you, uh, at times people also need to be driven because everybody is busy. Everybody has his own job. I, when I come to board, I have 10 agenda to get approved or maybe to, because of regulatory requirements, I have to come. But at the same time, what board can do for me? I think this point also discussed in the, in the, in the will, previous yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Now, we also did a, a different thing like, uh, you find most of the companies do quarterly board meetings. Same day they will do audit committee, same day they will do board, and then you run short of time. I think this also point was test based. Now, what, what we have started doing is, we have audit committee a day before, or two days before the board meeting. So, there is enough time. Directors can't have a feeling that now I am running by the clock. It should be over. No. So that thing also can be asked by the independent directors. And I'm telling you, as a KMP, as a person who is responsible for uh, the entire financial function of the organization, I'll feel happy about it. So please ask, and, and uh, it's more of a suggestion uh, to the IDs. I know a lot of IDs are sitting here, because that gives a lot of time, because it also time to management. In case, if I do audit and board same day, then what message I am giving? Are they simply stamping body? If they give any feedback, do I have a time to incorporate those feedback? It works both ways. So I think it's a very, very wide uh, ambit. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I, I'll <laughs> take a pause here. I can go on and on and on on this subject. Uh, excellent point, Sunil. And I think uh, these are some of the good practices that, uh, as we discussed in the previous, how can we create some kind of a, a body of knowledge, body of best practices, so that these practices can get implemented. As uh, audit professionals, we also see a wide variety in terms of various companies with we, which we work, some have the good practices that you spoke about and some really do not where uh, the, the audit committee or the independent directors really don't spend so much time with the auditors. So the point that was made is important that there is greater collaboration and uh, sharing. So the point in terms of how, what is the input that the independent directors give to the auditors on what are the things that they want to be covered. I think that also is a very important uh, point. Yeah, yeah. It's not five, it's not less, it is six to seven. You see significant improvement in the last couple of years. And you know, like Sunil said, it's not about a regulatory burden, but it is people have started seeing the benefits of what this can do for the organization. People have started seeing a direct benefit in terms of the market valuation. Right. A right. strong systems and processes, a very well governed organization is showing a direct correlation to what your what your market worth is. And when, when promoters and shareholders are seeing this, they are actually upping the ante in terms of adopting some of the. I completely agree, Nisha, and I'm just keeping in here because <laughs> the same point I made in, in your last conference in Bangalore, governance has a multiple. And more and more promoters are now recognizing it. And I think that's what is uh, helping to make a big leap 
forward rather than looking everything as a imposition of a regulation. And I think that's the role that independent directors need to play where they also educate the promoters on the value that gets uh, uh, derived. So Bhaskar, over to you as the uh, chief audit executive. Uh, how, how do you see this uh, evol uh, evolving and what are the good practices that you have seen from your company and from the Tata Group perspective? Uh, thanks, Munit. Uh, thanks, DI. Now, first, let me make some, like, you know, caveats. Like, you know, I'm not representing, Yeah. I am going to speak to me, I'll speak to yeah. the, uh, in this forum as an independent person, yeah. giving my views. First of all, you know, I have excellent company. We have model board members, we have model KMPs, now, there's no recommendation from it. It's a wonderful audience. Like. But practically what happens is like, so uh, now, depending on the organization, like, you know, or, you know, like maybe there are well-governed organizations where the maturity is very high. But there are like startups where they are in a hurry. So it is quite possible they are conscious of things. So it is quite possible controls are having its own place. Maybe there's a journey. But then, you know, like at that point of time, maybe there's a call which has been taken. So, in each, each and every facet, like, you know, be it processes, be it systems, be it people, everywhere, you know, like there are, you know, there's a scope for improvement. Suppose, you know, for an example, you know, even in the board, you know, like you might induct people who may not be really of the real caliber. That's quite possible. You also induct people, like, you know, I mean, who are conducting all these functions. They are not, you know, again, really, you know, up the curve. Now you suddenly find some old timer, you know, like who has been made as an internal auditor. Now people do not understand what is an internal audit. It's a profession. Just because he was an accountant doesn't mean he's an auditor. So, I mean, that's something, these are all factors which are there. So, I mean, when we are speaking about an idealistic, so where we are, we should be, you know, okay. I mean, apart from, you know, like what, you know, our, my fellow panelists was mentioning, there are good practices is to like, you know, hire a, Career internal auditor. So it should not be a, like, you know, somebody who has been doing something and suddenly, like, you know, you make him as an internal auditor. So you have a CAE who doesn't know internal audit and he is recruiting a team. There are people who kind of, you know, there are people, like, for example, there is lot of, you know, evangelization which is required at the board level. Why internal audit is important. Now what happens, you know, like somewhere in the organization, certain things are done, not done. To a audit objection. Hai. But audit objection, what is this? Nothing called audit objection. Because there is a risk, because of this issue, this is being done. So we are using not using the term appropriately. We should use a term that you know there is a collective endeavor to address the risks, how it is meeting the objective of the organization. So this is extremely important. I think yeah. I don't want to kind of sermonize, I will just pause. <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, so I think a very important point that Bhaskar uh, raises is that what is the caliber, what is the stature of the uh, chief audit uh, executive because a lot of responsibilities or expectations that we have are going to be possible only when that individual has that uh, stature. Practically we see uh, uh, while we all say that yes it is something which is benefit for the organization but uh, audit ends up becoming a function which has to challenge a lot of uh, other decisions that the management is uh, taking. Uh, so this is a question, Chit. You, so you maybe want, I yeah, just want yeah. to supplement. Now, yeah, yeah. on this standards now, now for internal auditing, there are standards. So how many organizations are, you know, like formally accepting, you know, adopting those standards? That's also important. Yeah. Maybe we should continue. We'll <laughs> no, come no, back. Well, we'll come back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's something important. Standards yeah. are there, but yeah. what is the legal backing to those standards? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. point that we yeah, raised. Yeah. Yeah. Companies Act actually does not define Correct. anything Correct. on the role Correct. of the... In, in, but uh, uh, Chetan, maybe uh, first you and Anisha. Is that the board, the uh, theoretically speaking, the audit head reports to the audit uh, committee, committee. Right? Practically we see in a lot of cases that doesn't happen, okay. Uh, his appointment, his remuneration, the budget that is allocated for uh, audit is actually defined, decided by the CFO uh, uh, typically or maybe in, uh, by the uh, uh, CEO. What is the role that the independent directors or the audit committee should play uh, in the entire process of appointment to giving the right remuneration and supporting the internal auditor uh, to discharge his responsibility with uh, uh, confidence and conviction. 
information. Can I go first? Okay. So I'll uh, use an American an analogy over here, which says the buck stops with me, right? So if the auditor, if the audit committee chair, okay, and the audit committee says that, guys, the buck stops with me. However, the admin stuff could be with the CFO or the CEO. You'd probably have a solution. Now, where? What do you mean by uh, you know the buck stops with me? And again, uh, when you look at an organization, you have uh, you know these have the dotted line and you have the straight line. Uh, the auditors, typically internal auditors, are, are, are guys who got both dotted and straight with two sets of people. It's with management because uh, remember, um, I mean, in a very, very simplistic term, internal auditors are appointed by management. And management is represented by board and the CXO and, and, and the promoters and all. So essentially, it's a, it's, it's a set of people who are going to rely on a professional or set of professionals to give them comfort as Anisha kind of called out in this three lines of defense, right? And they are the third line of defense, which means they are, uh, you know, after the first two are, are, are done. And you can't just hold one set only, you know, the only last defense to be the only, only defense. So coming back to this piece, like, what should we do? We need to do something collectively, okay? Uh, and you do see that happening more and more. Internationally, it happened earlier. Probably we are still about 10, 15 years behind in terms of evolution. But uh, the, 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 it's just not reporting, but it's about the ownership. I, as the audit committee, take the ownership. Guys, you know, everybody will get that. That's my view. Do you see uh, the uh, audit committee playing an active role in appointment of the independent director, not just approve, appro approving, but that participating in that, yeah, participating in that process, making sure that the remuneration which gets decided for the uh, audit head, and also a lot of time there are outsourced uh, service provider that there is adequate uh, remuneration and it is not just treated as a cost with cost of compliance and hence the cost needs to be just uh, managed. Uh, so, so see, yes, I mean, uh, almost like a 50% track record of, uh, like I said, you know, it varies across company, but at least I've seen 50% of the companies bringing up the profile of the candidate, sharing alternate profiles, but this is in case of a new hire. In most cases, when, when you get inducted on the board, you know, there is already an individual and there's already a function that's running in a certain way, okay? And you have to actually just evaluate it from that lens, that there is an incumbent here who's performing a certain role, is he or she doing it well? Now, the issue that happens is that almost internally, internal audit is almost seen like a police department. Okay, it's like that police, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, a, and a kind of a victim uh, uh, in many uh, cases, you know. It's almost that the departments are defending to internal auditors. We have seen that in the audit committee as well several times that, you know, the internal audit raises a certain point and if there's management sitting there, they would immediately jump to the defense, you know, but this, 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 you know, while of course the pre-alignment happens, but sometimes it's like they should not feel the need to defend to an internal auditor, okay? Uh, they should actually be aligned with the internal auditor that the internal auditor is helping them. In many, at many places, it seems like the management feels they are getting exposed by the internal auditor. All their weaknesses, all the all the chinks in the armor are actually coming out in the open, and they feel vulnerable. Now, that level of trust between the various functions and the internal audit uh, function is very important, and that individual has to play a very critical role of actually doing this balancing act of saying, "You can trust me. I'm not here to expose you. Okay, I'm not here to you know." And people actually want to posture in front of the board and, and show their best, uh, put their best foot forward. And when they see themselves, you know, uh, some of their processes, like if any function is getting audited and if there's a process weakness that is highlighted, there is an immediate, you know, kind of uh, resistance that happens. Now, that I think is something that needs to be fixed. That level of trust so that they open up, not just when, the, when they're sharing the findings, but also when they're auditing, you know, when these things are going on. Yeah. Now, management and CEOs and, and top leadership needs to play a very, very crucial role. In one of the organizations, we suggested, we realized that, you know, the, the person was not powerful enough to, uh, to be able to, you know, stand up to the, the functional heads or whatever and was getting a little bogged down or cowed down. 
we suggested an external internal auditor. Okay, so there are internal internal auditors who are who are you know placed by the organization. Then we suggested for certain functions in certain uh, areas, you know, to, to get an external internal auditor to remove that bias. And then that kind of created a kind of a healthy, uh, you know, benchmarking for the internal auditor to raise his or her bar. So those are the kind of practical things that you need to do, I guess. Great, great. And we'll talk about more about the right balance and how do you use external internal auditor. Uh, one of the points that was raised on the matters like tone at the top, uh, culture, uh, uh, social media risk, right? But more at, uh, and in, in this survey also we spoke about this, things like who looks at tone at the top, who looks uh, the cultural aspect uh, of, uh, of the organization. Typically we heard that this is not done by internal auditors. Some people said that internal audit might not even have the capability, stature uh, to actually look at uh, uh, these, these matters. So, uh, Bhaskar, what is your experience in terms of how these matters, which really uh, are important for the over, from overall corporate governance point of view, how do these things get uh, covered, and what would be your suggestion uh, on this? I think you know there has to be a very high element of confidence, trust, and confidence between the board and the internal audit. So, for example, from a, if the, the internal auditor or the chief audit executive has the stature and he has got the competence. And, you know, then the, the trust can be easily kind of built. Yeah, yeah. So, it is quite possible there are some selective cases the board will want the CAE to directly look at. So, especially the tone at the top, you know, you have informal meets, discussions, like, you know, this proposal has come, you know, what do you think? So, they have, a, they have the liberty to, you know, pick up the phone and call, you know, have a private conversation. Have you heard about this? This is what is happening in the organization. Because yeah. sometimes the auditor is not private to certain things which are happening. So you come to know from the board actually. Like, you yeah, know. Yeah. So it, again, it all emanates out of the trust and confidence of the board and the internal auditor. Now it is quite possible that if in the organization, you know, you are appointing a namesake head of audit, just a you know, new person, you know, just to fulfill a statutory regulation. He may not have that, you know, or he or she may be like, you know, mm. may not have the stature or the depth. So it's deliberately kind of, you know, it's kept away, you know, it is being done in some other manner, you know, all sort of things happen. So one is a very structured, methodical way how these things can be done. Another way is like a pragmatic way. So I don't think, you know, we should be able to say that this is how it should be always done. Because it is quite possible if the respect to like, the CAE is not able to fulfill that com com assurance, provide the assurance. The board is at liberty to kind of, you know, seek some other assurance also. So that's when I look at it. You know, uh, there is a, uh, again, if you look at the COSO uh, framework, uh, there is a section in there which talks about evaluating uh, the whole control environment. The entity level control. Exactly. The, the and, so, yeah, 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 exactly. But unfortunately, Chetan, what we have seen in practice, entity level again becomes more of a checklist based thing that do you have a policy and procedure in place? Yes, policy and procedure is there. Is code of conduct there? Yes, code of conduct there. So how do you really peel the onion and... I, don't fill up the checklist without doing your job. Ha. Okay. And that is... I mean, I, I, again, I'll just take an example. I mean, at PepsiCo, every GM was interviewed at least once a year, every GM, irrespective of the size of the business once a year by statutory order. And, and, and we, and the GM would use to call you as a CFO and say, kya puchne wala hai? you know, all that kind of stuff. But the point is that, and those are pretty candid conversation, and these guys have access to, you know, all your whistle, uh, you know, all your complaints that have come in, all your posh stuff. So, and, and some of the GMs got fairly uncomfortable, you know, because, and that then told you how the organization goes on. And I do believe that, uh, there are more organizations to kind of do that. Uh, and back to the board, should they ask answers? Absolutely, yes. And I think that's the important point where a lot of time the discussion between the board and the management gets limited to the CEO and the CFO. And hence the entire perspective that is there is, is channelized uh, through those uh, two uh, offices. How how do you actually invite other stakeholders, other management uh, personnel, the second line, third line, uh, to, to actually get that feeling? I think that's again a good practice that we have heard and I think Chetan, that's what you are yeah. in a way. I just want to pose some you know, matters. Yeah. 
So who, who is interested in assessing entity level controls? So right now it's more maybe from a statutory audit point of view because he has a reporting obligation. Yeah. Now board, you know, okay, you like certify, that's fine. It's a more of sort of based on whatever comfort you get. So you, know, you get, you know, like maybe from an external, you know, a rating agency or, you know, from various other, you know, framework. They're also like, you know, you'll be able to kind of draw some inferences. So that's something, you know, which we need to introspect. So we can always talk about entity level controls, but the fact of the matter, who wants it? So that's yeah. something which has to be understood. You know? yeah. So uh, moving on, the, uh, the next topic that, and while we have covered bits of it, uh, I would like to also now deliberate more in terms of what is the role the independent directors can actually play at a more tactical uh, level to enable internal audit to really discharge its uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, we have said that yes, the appointment has to be of a person with the caliber. We have discussed that uh, there needs to be more uh, deliberations and uh, discussions. Uh, in practice, as we see and what the survey also uh, mentioned, uh, and when, especially when we spoke to some of the uh, KMPs, they felt that there, some of that is uh, 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 lacking. They also felt that uh, we get sometimes isolated to the point that Anisha, you mentioned that uh, people felt uh, that they get too uh, pressurized. So what are the good practices uh, uh, around it? For example, the, the issues as they go from the starting of the audit to level after level of discussion and finally when they get reported to the audit committee, uh, there is a dilution uh, on the uh, uh, points. How do you understand that what actually transpired through the entire audit process before the, it reaches the uh, board, uh, that process was uh, robust or, or, or not. So these are some of the points where I would like the views of uh, all of you to say how does independent director, how does the audit committee really support uh, the auditors to discharge their uh, responsibility and really ask the right questions so that they can give the assurance that is expected uh, from them. So anybody would like to start? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. No, no, definitely. So, uh, and I can share with uh, some examples so that I think it will help uh, correlate. So, uh, as a practice, uh, and it's not about us, I think a lot of companies I know, uh, they also have this good practice of maybe asking board what they want to review, then presenting at the beginning of the year, the entire order to plan for the year. Uh, this is what we will do. Do you have any input, suggestion? Most of the times, I would say majority, you will see that board will tend to say, okay, Whatever plan you have said is fine. So, at that point, when the management is coming up for the internal audit plan for the rest of the, for the coming year, these are the areas we will focus on. These are the areas we will look into more detail. These are the areas we will do benchmarking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At that point in time, I think the independent directors actually can add value based on their experience because they don't sit only on one company board; they sit on multiple company boards. So that's where they can also bring that insight of what they see as best practices for some other companies. So that company can also benefit. They, they actually see that, oh, now my director is telling me that this is what happens in some other companies. Why don't you look at like this? Why don't you add this as an area? Why don't you add cybersecurity as an area? Why don't you add this as an area? What do you think about your technology? What do you think about the future? Can that be somewhere does benchmarking? Might not necessarily be an internal audit point, but that's where they can add value to audit and also the annual plan. I think that's very important. The another point which is important and I think I can, uh, this is linked to also the point which was discussed earlier is, do we see internal audit as an audit or do we see internal audit as adding value? Because, uh, and I think a lot of auditors have also started doing internal auditors because uh, we do mostly get internal audit done through ex external experts. They also tend to now show their, what is their return? Basically how they have uh, raised uh, areas or highlighted which has actually given direct monetary benefit to the company, which is much more than the fees which company is paying. So there is a clear return which uh, you will see that auditors also try and add value because at the end of the day, they also have a mirror to see as to am I just doing a tick in the box for the company or am I adding value? Because if I am adding value, I will also grow with the company and I will also <laughs> grow my clientele, etc. whatever it is. So if board also starts seeing that perspective and actually question in the right way, in, in the meeting rather than uh, making it a defensive discussion, how it can be a discussion of value addition rather than its internal auditor versus management, how it can be, okay, this was the point, 
what are the learnings what are the things <coughs> you are doing in terms of improvement of systems processes controls how it will benefit the for the company in the medium term long term there are a lot of these such aspects which actually can bring a, a very positive environment in the meeting when the internal audit is being presented because i know uh, we also have our peers our friends at times it's it's like what uh, uh, mr gupta also mentioned the issues get funneled so when the first cut audit report comes we'll have 10 high risk areas 10 medium and 10 low by the time it reaches i gets allocated to one at max or two and medium half and low tickets okay so the point is rather than doing that i think it's important to see what value is being added by interlocutors in fact i would be happy that all the high risks are presented to the board so that everybody's cognizance gets minuted gets tracked and the next meeting the alter comes up like i say oh this was the observation this is the action management has taken and this the company has benefited so i think the entire process can be made very healthy and very in a in a cohesive and a positive uh, approach